Hi, my name's Andy. Um, this is the fourth talk on Scheme. Uh, it's entitled Recursion in Scheme. Really, it's about how do you write functions uh, the normal way in Scheme. And the normal way to write functions or procedures in Scheme is to use recursion. So we're going to have a look at uh, some functions and how you would implement them. So we're going to look at some things that, that hopefully make it a bit easier to understand how recursion works. Uh, then, uh, so we're going to look at factorial, Fibonacci, and some other functions. And we're going to talk about what shape different types of recursion have, um, and whether some shapes are better than other others, uh, and why. Uh, and then we're going to look at whether we can uh, remodel some of our um, functions so that they have a better shape. So let's start with factorial. So uh, uh, at the top here is a function which is uh, supposed to implement. Um, <coughs> the function factorial which you might know from math, so that's when you write a number and then put an exclamation mark after it. Uh, that means multiply that number by the number one less than it, and then multiply that by the number one less than it, and so on, until you get down to zero. Um, don't multiply it by zero or you get zero. You, um, factorial zero is one. Anyway, I'm getting off the point. Point is, um, uh, this function implements that mathematical function and it does it in a way that's quite similar to the way you might express it in maths and not very similar to the way you might implement it in um, some programming languages uh, but this is the uh, this is a way you could implement it in scheme um, and we'll find we'll see a better way later on but uh, uh, this is a recursive implementation so let's um, have a look at it um, work out how it works and it'll uh, hopefully help us understand uh, what recursion is and how it works. So um, the top line um, uh, defines a function. So the word uh, define there means I'm defining something and the thing I'm defining is a function because there's a bracketed list that comes after it. And the function name is fact and it takes one argument which is called n. If you look at the bottom of the screen you can see uh, that this function does work, uh, factorial of 3 is 6 and 4 is 24 and so on. Uh, so it does do the mathematical um, factorial function at least for these inputs. Um, so the second line down after the function definition is the body of the function. Um, it's an if expression. What it says is if n equals 0, that equals 0 n thing, that means n equals 0, it's just equals is just a function which takes two arguments and returns true if they're equal. Um, so if n is 0, we return the first thing, which is 1. If not, we return the next thing we get to, which is on the bottom line, which is this longer expression. So basically, factorial of 0 is 1, so you return 1 if you pass in 0. And otherwise, you return uh, the result of calling the star function, which multiplies things. The first argument to the star function is n, which was the number we were passed in. And the next argument to the star function is the result of calling the fact function with an argument uh, which is minus n1, which means 1 less than n. That minus function takes in two arguments, and it returns the result of taking the second argument away from the first argument. So what's happening here is that this function is calling itself, but with a different argument, and using the answer to return its own answer. So um, this way of expressing it is pretty much the way I explained the factorial function mathematically earlier. Um, uh, the factorial is n times the factorial of n minus 1. And that's all we're expressing here. Uh, and at first glance it might seem like it doesn't work, but it does work because um, this will end eventually because every time we, we call factorial recursively, call itself, um, we pass in a smaller number. So eventually we'll get down to that zero case. That will return 1 and then we can use that 1 and multiply it by the thing that we've got um, in the next level up and keep going up the levels until you get to the answer. And that that kind of recursion you're going to have to get used to because that's the way uh, um, a lot of functions, most functions in Scheme are implemented. And it does, it gets easier to understand over time. Okay, so let's try another one. This one's uh, called Fibonacci. There's a famous mathematical series called the Fibonacci series. Uh, and the next term in the series is got by adding up the two previous terms. So um, if, uh, we start off with um, the, the two first two things in the series we just define to be 1 and 1. And the next thing in the series uh, is 2. And the next thing in the series is um, 2 plus 1, which makes 3. And the next thing in the series 
is 2 plus 3, which makes 5. And the next thing in the series is uh, 3 plus 5, which is 8. And you can see at the bottom of the screen here, we've got this fib function, which, given a number, tells you the nth Fibonacci number. So the third Fibonacci number is 2, the fourth one is 3, and so on. Uh, and at the top, you can see um, the way we've defined this function. The way we've defined it is, the first line uh, says we're defining a function, and the name is fib, and there's an argument called n. And the next line says that the, the body of this function is an if expression. And what we say is, uh, if n is less than or equal to 2, then return 1, because the first two terms, 1 and 2, um, are 1, by, by definition. Otherwise, we, t we return the result of calling the plus function with these two arguments. These two arguments are two separate calls to the fib function. So we're calling fib from inside fib, again, because this is recursion. Um, and the two arguments we pass to the fib function are n minus 1 and n minus 2. So fib of n is fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2. So again, we're expressing it quite in a way that's quite close to the way you would describe it in maths, but not the way you would uh, implement it in some languages. And it turns out not the way you should implement it in Scheme either, but um, hopefully if you can get your head around why this works, um, it'll help you understand the better implementation we'll get to you later. Okay, let's look at another function. This is a really silly function. It uh, doesn't really do anything at all. Um, well, it hardly does anything at all. Um, but it's going to be useful for us to talk about the different types of recursion that there are. So this is a function called countdown, and you can see at the bottom what it does. If you uh, run the countdown function passing an argument of 4, what it does is it prints out 4, 3, 2, 1, uh, and then its return value is is the empty list, which is the same as null if you've been following the other videos. So the last thing in the line doesn't really matter, that's its return value. Um, what we care about with the countdown function is that it prints, that, prints out 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, now, I'm sure you can imagine how you would do this in C, uh, but we're going to do this quite a different way uh, to help us understand um, uh, the normal way of doing things in Scheme. So, uh, this is another recursive function. So, the first line says we're defining a function called countdown, uh, which has one argument, uh, which is called n, uh, and the body of the function is an if expression. And the if says if n is 0, we return null, and that explains the bracket bracket at the bottom of the screen here. Um, once we got down to 0, we return null, and null gets printed as bracket bracket. Um, and then the second part of the if um, is this begin thing. So I haven't explained begin before, um, but begin is quite straightforward. You don't need to um, understand very much. It's basically a way that we, we're using it here to group together three... Um, statements or three function calls uh, into one place. So if has two places, right? It has, uh, if the expression is true, then you, you have that first place, and that's where we've put null. And the second place uh, is where the begin is. So begin just says, OK, in this one place, I'm going to do three things. And the three things um, that we're going to do are display n, which is essentially print, uh, which is why we get 4321 printed out, because display prints it out. Uh, and then new line, which means uh, write a new line to, um, which is why four, three, two, one aren't all next to each other. And then once we've um, printed out n, uh, we're going to call countdown. So we're going to call ourselves, and the argument we're going to pass in is one less than the argument we were given. So we're counting down. Okay, make sense so far? Um, okay, so let's talk about another function. Let's talk about um, the map function. So map is a built-in function in Scheme. Um, uh, but we're going to talk about how you might implement map um, to try and understand a bit more um, uh, how you would implement more complicated recursive functions. So um, if you look at the bottom, you can see how this my map function that we're going to define works. So if we if we call my map and we pass in a function called abs, which is one of the built-in functions in Scheme, which returns the absolute value, i.e., the positive uh, positivized version of a number. Um, so we're passing the function abs, um, not calling the function abs, but passing the function abs to the my map function. Um, and the second argument to my map is a list of 2, minus 3, and 4. And what we get back from the my map function is another list, um, and this time it contains 2, 3, and 4. So the abs function has been applied 
to everything in the list and we get a list back with the answers in. Okay, so how do we define my map? Well, um, the top line says we're defining a function called my map and it takes two arguments. The arguments are called fun and lust. Um, and we check whether the list, whether lust is null. And what that means is, is it the empty list? Which is uh, similar to what we were doing before, checking whether you've got to zero. This is saying, have we got to the end? Is the list empty? Uh, if so, we return null, which means return the empty list. And if you recall uh, from the video about um, lists and pairs, um, uh, the very last thing in a list has always got to be null, this empty list. Um, so what we're saying is we've got to the end of the um, incoming list, which means we've got past that. <coughs> we've got past the 2, minus 3 and 4 in the example, and we've got to this special marker at the end. If so, return the special marker. So if you pass an empty list into my map, you'll immediately get an empty list back, which seems the right behavior. Uh, if you pass in a non-empty list, you'll get to the second part of the if, which is this cons expression. So we're consing together two things, which is the way you build lists. And if you need to go to the video about lists to understand this, please do. Uh, so what we're doing is um, cons will give us a list by, t um, making, by taking in the first thing to go in that list and the rest of the list, which is another list. Um, so the first thing in the list is going to be um, this first thing uh, immediately after the word cons, which is the result of calling the function that was passed in on this car of the list that was passed in, where car gets out the first thing in the list. So basically, call the function on the first thing in the list and stick the answer onto the beginning of a list, which is what cons is doing, and the rest of the list is going to be this last line here. So the rest of this is going to be created by calling my map again, passing in the function we were given originally, um, and passing in the rest of the list as the list. So could or lust means the rest of the list. So we kind of it, it feels weird this if you're not used to it. It feels like we're getting we're getting the answer for free. We basically say um, do it for the front thing on the list and then just assume that it works for the rest of the list. And what happens is it goes through and everything is the front at some point uh, in the list until you get to the end and then it sticks them all back together again and you get your correct answer. So, um, now I want to talk about what is the shape of this recursion and um, I haven't defined what that means so bear with me. Um, here's a reminder, there's this function uh, called fact that we saw earlier which calculates the factorial and uh, uh, let's look at what happens when we evaluate the factorial of 3. So we start off writing factorial of 3 and then what happens is that turns into a call to the star function. The last line of this function turns into a call of the star function. We multiply 3 by the result of um, calling the factorial function with an argument of 2. Um, after that we can substitute in again and say the um, calling factorial with an argument of 2 is like uh, results in uh, a call to the star function multiply um, with an argument of 2 and the other argument is fact 1 and we can substitute in again uh, calling a fact function with an argument of 1 uh, means multiply 1 by factorial of 0 and when we get the factorial of 0 we get to the first part of that if so we get back a 1 instead of uh, so we can substitute in directly a 1 in, um, for that fact 0 and now we've got that 1 we can we can do this multiplication so 1 times 1 makes 1 and now we've got that 1 we can do this multiplication so we've got um, 2 times 1 is 2 and then now we've got back we can do that multiplication and the answer is 6 and this is quite often a good way of thinking about how a uh, scheme evaluate stuff. Um, it doesn't work when you've got things uh, that can be modified and changed, but where you haven't, uh, this is called the substitution model. And you can basically substitute in uh, the correct part of um, whatever function you're calling, the return value of that function, in place of the function call and just keep going and until eventually it reduces down to the answer. Okay, so let's have a look at the shape of fib. So here's a reminder of uh, what fib looks like basically um, for the first uh, if, if n is less than or equal to 2 you return 1 otherwise you return the result of adding up Fibonacci fib of n minus 1 and fib of n minus 2 so let's look at what happens when we ask what the fib of 5 is 
And what you get back is an addition of the fib of 4 and the fib of 3. And then you can substitute in for both of them. So that's an addition of 3 and 2 and 2 and 1. And then you can substitute in again for the 3 and the 2. Notice that on the right hand side, um, fib of 2, in fact in, on both the left and the right, fib of 1 and 2 get, get replaced with just the value 1 because that's the first part of the if. So this line that we've just seen has three places where fib of 2 or 1 gets replaced by just a 1. Uh, and then we can do the same again with these other two fibs. And meanwhile, we've added up 1 plus 1 on the right there to get a 2. Uh, and then we can add up 1 plus 1 and get another 2. And now we've got add up 2 plus 1 and get 3. And then we add 3 plus 2 and we get the answer 5. So um, uh, you'll notice, by the way, that um, we're calling fib a lot more than we really need to to get these answers. We're calculating the fib of 2 uh, three times there. We're calculating the fib of 3. Um, twice, I think. Yeah. Um, so there's something a bit wrong about this implementation anyway. But what I want you to look at is the shape of what we've just seen. Okay, it's kind of triangular shaped, and the previous one as well, fact, was also kind of triangular shaped. Now let's look at the shape of the countdown function. So here's a reminder of what the countdown function looks like. Um, once you get to the end, you return null, and before that you print out n and then call yourself recursively with uh, an argument of n minus 1. So countdown of 4 uh, will print out 4 and then it will end up, the result, end result of countdown of 4 will be call a function uh, countdown of 3 and then countdown of 2 and countdown of 1. You'll notice that the shape of this is not triangular shaped, it's kind of uniform shaped. We can get down, eventually we finish off so some recursion, recursive functions end up looking triangular when you evaluate them. Some of them don't. So what does this, what does this matter? Well, what it matters is, in a language which can take advantage of this flat shape, um, recursive functions don't need to take up a lot of memory, which is what we're used to. We're used to, when you call a function, um, you take what you've got at the moment and um, put it aside and you make a new stack frame um, where all the variables needed to run this particular bit of code get pushed onto the stack and then we make a call uh, and we jump in our assembly language or in our machine code to um, the location of the, f the code for the function and we've got the variables waiting for us there in the right place on the stack. But when you have um, function which has this as flat shape, um, what that really means, what I'm saying when I say flat shape, is that the previous stack frame isn't needed anymore. So when we're calculating uh, countdown 4, we don't need any of the information, that we don't need the, to know that n was 4 when we're doing countdown 3. We can throw away that stack frame. So um, languages that do this thing called the tail call optimization. Uh, or I should say interpreters or compilers or environments that do this thing that is called the tail call optimization they notice when you don't need to know the information that was passed to this function in order to give you the answer and, and in that case instead of making a new stack frame and adding it onto the top of the stack or the bottom of the stack um, what they do is they throw away the information that you're using in this function and um, and just so they pop that off the stack before they then push on uh, the information you need to calculate the new function that you're calling um, and give you back the answer. And the situation in which that is okay to do is exactly the situation where you are, in your function you are returning a call to another function. If you're doing something else, if you're calling another function and then adding one to it later or something like that, you can't do this because you still need um, all the information that's in the, the, the original function in order to get an answer. But if in your original function all you do is call another function and that is your return value, the return value of that function is your return value, then you don't need the information in this function anymore. All you need is the new function that you're calling, the arguments to that. So 
hopefully that will make some sense. Um, we will get into what that means in practice in a second, but first of all, let's just look at the shape of the my map function because that's also of interest. So imagine we're calling uh, my map with this list of um, two minus three and four and the apps function. Well, what happens with that is you substitute in um, you you const together abs of two and my map of abs of this shorter list which only has minus three and four in it because you've stripped off the front thing and dealt with it. So abs of two becomes out to be two and then this call to my map becomes const of the abs of minus three and the rest of the list which in this case is just four. Uh, so now we're consting two with consting three with consting the absolute value of four with calling my map with the empty list. So now my map with the empty list just returns as null and the absolute value of 4 is 4. So now we're up being asked to const 4 with null which gives us a list um, of 4. I'll look back at the video about pairs and lists if you don't understand that. Uh, now we can const 3 with that list to get um, a list of 3 and 4 and we can const 2 and get a list of 2 and 3 and we're all done. Um, let me go back. So the shape of my map is again a kind of triangular shape. It gets wider and wider and then thinner and thinner. So let's try implementing facts in a different way to avoid having this triangular shape. So at the bottom you can see this new function called fact it works the same as um, the factorial function does. Uh, you get the right answers. But at the top you can see it's defined a little bit differently. So inside uh, fact it, so we cut, so the top line says we're defining a function called fact it which takes a variable called n and then the, most of the body of that function is another definition, it's the definition of another function so skip to the end and you'll see the rest of the body of the function, the main thing the thing that actually does something in this function is that it calls impl, which is the function we've defined above uh, with an argument of 1 and also by passing in the end that was originally given to us. So what does impl do? Well impl takes in is a function it's a function called impl that takes in two arguments. One's called ac, which accumulates the answer, and one is called count, which tells you how far you've got. So um, uh, the body of this impl function is an if expression which says if count is zero, we return the answer that we've accumulated, this ac. Otherwise, um, return the result of calling impl. Um, multiplying count by uh, ac, which means the uh, the new value of ac is going to be this count value multiplied by the existing value of ac. Remember ac started off as 1, so we're gradually going to multiply it by everything as we count through. Um, and the other argument to impl is uh, count minus 1. So every time we call impl, we reduce count by 1, and we increase our accumulator by multiplying it by count. So when I put it like that, you can probably kind of see why this works. So we have this impl function, and we, we start it off by saying, OK, imagine you started off with, with 1. Uh, now do this n times. Uh, and each time you multiply by uh, this n that you've passed in. As, and the n gets smaller as you go down. So I may or may not have explained that enough to, for you to understand it, but let's look at the shape of it. So if we ask for the factorial of 3, uh, that gets substituted to be um, impl 1, 3, which is the very bottom line of the function. And then uh, it, what does impl do? Well, impl turns into another call to impl, where we're multiplying 3 by 1 and we're taking 1 off 3. So multiplying 3 by 1 gives us 3, taking 1 off 3 gives us 2. So now we can substitute in this impl call. So impl is uh, multiplying and taking 1 off again. So we can work that out. And then we we call it, uh, this works out to be another call to impl, which does another multiply, another minus. Uh, and you can almost see there. Uh, once you substitute that in a call impl, then count has now got to zero, so we just return ac, and ac has got to be six. So maybe that helps you understand why this works. What I want you to look at here is, yes, that seems like a little bit more of a complicated way to implement fact, although once you're used to it, it's not too bad. Um, but look at the shape of this. Um, it goes in and out a bit, but it is bounded. It, um, it never gets wider than a single call to impl. 
and the scheme interpreter can take advantage of that to make this uh, efficient and in particular to make it not run out of memory no matter how big the argument you pass it which it would have done um, if you did this in a language in a language that doesn't do tail call optimization if you implement um, this factorial function uh, even this one, this this nicer form in some sense, you'll run out of memory because you're calling functions which call functions which call functions which call functions, um, and you get a new stack frame created in memory for each function call. Okay, so let's have a look at how we can do fib in a similar way. So uh, let's define a function called fib it, which takes in uh, an argument n. By the way, I believe. No, oh, okay. Um, I thought I'd made a mistake in the slides here on Fibbit, but it looks like I haven't. Okay. Uh, let me know if I have. Um, in fact, let me know if I've made a mistake in any of my slides, please. Anyway, we define a function called Fibbit, takes in an argument n, and again we have the, uh, we have an impl function. So skip right to the end and look. Um, we're calling impl with um, two arguments: one, one, and n. And uh, uh, the impl function has two accumulators now instead of one. So uh, calling them accumulators may be the wrong word, but anyway, what this does is it tracks um, the n minus one value and the n minus two value. Um, remember that Fibonacci numbers are made by adding up the n minus one value and the n minus two value. Um, so the previous uh, element in the series and the one before that. So. Uh, in this impl function, ac1 represents the previous element, and ac2 represents um, the one before that, and count tells us how far we've still got left to go. So if count has got down to 2, we've finished, and we return that the answer that we're storing in ac1. So uh, in some sense, uh, we're not. it's not the previous one anymore, it's the answer. And... Uh, if count is not equal to 2, i.e. it's bigger than 2, what we do is we call impl again, we add up the ac1 and ac2 values to get our new uh, answer, and we pass ac1 as the new value of ac2. So the previous value ne has now become the previous but 1. Uh, and then we reduce count by 1 by, calling, uh, by passing in count minus 1 as the value of count. So probably a better way of, of putting it is that impl takes in the current answer and the previous current answer. So ac1 is the current answer and ac2 is the previous current answer. If we've got um, count down to 2, we return our current answer. If not, we get the next answer by adding up the previous answer to our current answer. And we, we relabel um, the current answer to be the previous answer in our recursive call. So um, let me stop waffling. I'm not making it a bit any better. So uh, let's look at how that works out. So if we ask for um, Fibonacci of 5, then that gets substituted as a call to impl. And um, I've immediately substituted in here um, the result of calling impl with 1, 1, 5. And what that is is uh, 1 plus 1. Uh, uh, is another call to impl with arguments 1 plus 1, 1 and 5 minus 1. So that's the second last line being substituted in with the um, ac1 and ac2 being 1 and 1 and n being 5. So we can do those additions and subtractions, get the uh, answer. Now we call impl again, substitute in there, we get uh, uh, 2 plus 1. So you can see where the Fibonacci numbers are coming from. We've got the 1 plus 1 above. Um, which gives us the next Fibonacci number. Now 2 plus 1 gives us the next Fibonacci number, which is 3. Meanwhile, all the time count is going down. So now we add up 3 plus 2 to get the next Fibonacci number. And count is back is down to 2. Now because count is 2, uh, we hit the other part of the if, so we return 5. Um, so again, look at the shape of this. Uh, this is only ever one call to impl wide. Now these calls to impl get wider and narrower, but there's only ever one call to impl. And, and the reason for this is that if you look at the definition of impl, it ends, it always ends either returning ac1, which is just simple, or returning another call to impl. And the, the return value of impl is a call to impl. It's a call to another function, not some calculation based on the answer of calling another function, which wouldn't work this way. So can we... 
uh, create an iterative form of map. You remember I implemented map earlier uh, in this function called mymap. Well, the answer is no. Um, because you're consing at the end of your implementation of map, you're doing something with the result of recursion rather than just recursing directly. However, some people in implementing scheme interpreters have, have implemented a bit of a cheat, which means um, if you end a function with a cons, they use a special extra bit of memory to store just the information needed to do that cons, um, which is a relatively um, small amount of memory, um, and you can you can act as if you've got tail call optimization in that case as well. Um, but I'm definitely not going to talk about that. Uh, and that's it for today.